Welcome to an introduction to remote sensing. My name is Dr. Russ Congleton. I'm a professor at the University of New Hampshire. You've probably heard that a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, that's what remote sensing is all about. It's about collecting pictures or what we call imagery and using that to learn about the earth. Okay, remote sensing is an applied science. It's a combination of a bunch of other disciplines or other sciences, including things like computer science and geography and mathematics and statistics and physics and some others. And we put that all together uh, to get this really special tool that allows us to map and monitor our earth and keep track of what's going on. So let's dig in and see what remote sensing is all about. So what is remote sensing? Well, here's an official definition. The art, science, and technology of obtaining reliable information about physical objects and the environment through the process of recording, measuring, and interpreting imagery and digital representations of energy patterns derived from non-contact sensor systems. Well, that sounds pretty daunting, but let's make it simple. Remote sensing is simply learning something about an object without being in direct contact with it. So learning something about some phenomena, some object without touching it. Okay, and so you can see from the image on the side here, we can do that from satellites way up in space. We can do that from cameras that we put in airplanes, or we can do it from um, new kinds of devices that have recently come along. Uh, you can see here what, what, what some people call a drone. We don't use that term. Um, we call them unmanned aerial systems. And you can also be on the ground. You could be uh, on a ladder or you could be even next to the object. As long as you don't directly touch the object, it's fine. Okay, So that's what remote sensing is, learning something about an object without touching it. In the past, we did remote sensing from the early days, from the 1860s or so, using um, film. Okay, So you, you, know, you know that in the old days, movies were done on film. Well, Photographs were done on film as well, and we call that analog remote sensing. And then over the last 20 years or so, we've really switched into the digital world, and you've got a, a, a camera on your cell phone that's digital, and you have uh, you know computers that work in the digital world, and so you understand that. And so there are two components to remote sensing. There's something called photo or image interpretation, and this is the art of remote sensing. It's deducing the significance of the objects. It's becoming a detective and trying to figure out using what we call the elements of image interpretation, what exactly we're looking at. And the elements that we look at are what's the size of the object? What's the shape of the object? What, what shadow does the object cast? What color is it? Is there a texture? Is there a pattern? Okay, so for example, if you had a bunch of uh, triangular shaped trees, we would we would might think that those are conifer trees. Okay, they're pointy at the top like a Christmas tree. And if you had a regular pattern, okay, on the ground where they were evenly spaced, so you could see from above, looking down, you had this regular pattern of pointy shaped trees, you might conclude using a confluence of evidence of, of multiple elements pointing to the same answer that this was a Christmas tree farm, okay? If the trees were more billowy, more rounded, you might conclude that those are deciduous trees. And if they were in a regular pattern, again, it might be an orchard. For instance, it might be an apple orchard, okay? And so deducing the significance, uh, becoming a detective and figuring those things out, you get better at it as you practice it. And then the other half of remote sensing is the measurements or the quantitative analysis, and we call that photogrammetry. So putting photo interpretation or image interpretation with photogrammetry together, we're able to learn a lot of things about an object without touching it. So as human beings, we actually have three 
remote sensing systems that we use. We use our nose, we smell things. Uh, we use our ears to hear things and we use our eyes to see things. Well, when we mostly are talking about remote sensing here, we're talking about using our eyes. Uh, other sciences might use our ears. You've heard of sonar and how uh, a whale or a dolphin communicates. Um, that's a whole different deal. Today, we're gonna talk about our eyes or electromagnetic energy or what we know of as light, okay? So you've probably seen electromagnetic energy before uh, and you know that the visible portion of the electromagnetic spectrum is a very small portion and it gets divided. If you use a prism and held it by a window or um, you would see the sunlight gets divided into these different components, blue, green, and uh, red light. But there's lots of other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that we don't see in. And you might know about gamma rays and certainly X-rays. If you uh, have a broken bone, you have to get your arm X-rayed or your leg X-rayed. And then there's infrared light. And then there's also um, radio waves and you might've heard of radar, okay? And so this is a little bit of, of physics. And so there are different properties of electromagnetic energy that we know about. And again, a little more physics. Uh, these three, uh, three properties are called wavelength, frequency, and velocity. And you probably remember that the velocity or the speed of light is a constant, at least in a vacuum. And so we don't worry about that very much. Uh, but we are interested in what wavelength and frequency are. And so wavelength is, as you can see in the picture here, the distance from the top of one wave to the top of the next wave, or from the trough, the bottom of one wave to the bottom of the next wave, or from any real place on any wave to the same place on the next wave. That's the wavelength, the length of the wave. And then frequency has to do with the number of waves that pass by in a given period of time. So you can see here we have a lower frequency with only two waves in that one second time frame, versus at the bottom, a little higher frequency uh, where we have four waves go by in that one second. And so we have an equation, frequency is equal to the velocity divided by the wavelength times this constant, C is a constant. And therefore we know that if we know the frequency, we know the wavelength, we can calculate the wavelength because they're based on this equation inversely proportional to each other. And so in remote sensing, we usually only deal with one. If you know one, you know the other, they're inversely proportional. That means as one goes up, the other goes down. Um, and so we tend to deal in wavelength in most remote sensing. Some engineering applications deal in frequency, but we deal in wavelength. So why use remotely sensed data? Okay, why is this a good idea to learn something about remote sensing? Well, remote sensing is less expensive than going to the ground and trying to learn everything you can on the ground. It makes sense that it would take a lot of time to send people um, to the field, to the ground, to, to make measurements and to learn everything. We can capture this a lot quicker and a lot more effectively, a, a lot more efficiently um, if we use remote sensing. Remote sensing also provides, provides what we call a bird's eye view or a view from above, okay? One of the things we think about from electromagnetic energy is that we only see in a very small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, but remote sensing, we can use other portions of the electromagnetic spectrum. So for instance, x-rays, you can see that your the bone in your arm um, is broken, right? And so, Remote sensing allows us to use these other wavelengths, which can be very, very, very powerful. And then probably most interesting, um, remote sensing allows us what we call various spatial and temporal scales, okay? So spatial is the level of detail. So I can see a big picture idea of a whole large area from far away. And then I can zoom in on specific locations that I'm more interested in. So those are different spatial scales. And I'll show you some um, different imagery at different spatial scales. And then we can also do it temporally. Temporally means over time. 
Okay, so I can look at what happened maybe 10 years ago, five years ago, and now, and see how things have changed. And so that gives me a powerful record of what's happening. Just to give you a little historical perspective, which I always think is interesting, really the first analog aerial photos were taken in the 1860s, so 150, 160 years ago at this point. Okay, so those are analog with film. They were taken from balloons because we didn't have airplanes then, right? Airplane wasn't invented until the Bright brothers did that in the early 1900s, okay? And so big development between 1860 and uh, 1910, 1920, 1930, um, especially World War I and then World War II. And so um, lots of military applications of remote sensing, as you might imagine, knowing um, what's going on with uh, uh, combatants. Okay, And so coming out of World War II, uh, widespread use of aerial photography um, because of all these people being trained in the wars and then they come out and they say okay let's use this for uh, you know some good things so for in, in natural resources in farming in um, urban development lots and lots of applications of remote sensing we didn't have the first satellites until the 1960s and those were weather satellites okay in the 1970s, 1972, specifically, a satellite called Landsat was launched by the United States. Uh, Landsat is the gold standard. We'll talk more about it in a minute. Um, but it was used for Earth observing. It was used to map the Earth and to see what was going on with agriculture, with forest, with droughts, with water, all, all kinds of interesting things with the Landsat satellite. In the 1980s, a second generation of Landsat satellites called the Thematic Mapper was launched. Um, other countries started getting involved, including um, France. They launched a satellite that they called SPOT. In the 1990s, we start getting into the digital world and get, getting out of the analog remote sensing. So a lot more with digital cameras, um, something called radar, which is an active sensor. Other countries getting involved and the beginning of uh, some commercial satellite companies with some failed launches, unfortunately. In, in the 2000s, we get into commercial high spatial resolution satellites. And so companies building these satellites that have really, really good detail, um, a lot of improvements in aerial cameras and the beginnings of something called LIDAR. Um, LIDAR is similar to radar. It sends out its own pulse of electromagnetic energy. Uh, and LIDAR was used to make um, uh, topographic maps, elevation data. In, the, in 2010 or so, uh, the dominance of digital cameras, really analog cameras, pretty much going away. Uh, LIDAR becoming really commercially viable. And more and more high spatial resolution um, sensor systems that we could use. And then in about 2015 or so, the advent of unmanned aerial systems for um, research purposes, for natural resource management, for agriculture, uh, for those kinds of things. So uh, really kind of a, a cool development, especially in the last 20 years, uh, a lot of amazing things have happened in the field of remote sensing. So as I mentioned, we need to understand a little about it bit about Landsat. Landsat is the gold standard. Um, we have a 50-year record now of imagery being collected by the Landsat satellite. The satellite imagery is freely available through the U.S. Geological Survey. Um, through, you can go online and download the imagery. Uh, you can, you'll see that uh, lots of applications uh, use this imagery, and we've got a continuous record of the world for the last 50 years, which allows us to do that kind of temporal uh, resolution that we just talked about. And so Landsat is a very, very powerful uh, tool. Um, other countries have launched their own satellite system similar to Landsat, but Landsat has been the gold standard for a long, long time. So we need to understand, I mentioned spatial resolution, I mentioned electromagnetic energy, we need to understand a little bit about this. 
but you already do. You know what a pixel is. You've got camera that's got a certain um, resolution. You've got a television screen that's got a certain spatial resolution, pixel or picture element, um, the size of the area covered uh, by one little area, one cookie cutter, if you will, um, on the sensor. And so you can see here a picture of a football field and different sensors that we have and different spatial resolutions. The smaller the pixel size, the more detail um, that you can see. And so having a, a 10 megapixel camera or a 20 megapixel camera, the 20 megapixel camera will give you, you know, more detail on what's going on. So here's an example we can see in the early days, back when Landsat was first launched, we had 80 meter pixels. And so um, it doesn't look like much with just 16 little pixels being shown on here but you can see that we quickly improved in spatial resolution. And so here's a little comparison of what you can see at 80 meter pixels, 40 meter pixels, 20 meter pixels. You're starting to at least get a feel that there are some buildings or some something that's um, bright white um, in there. When you get to 10 meter pixels, you start to feel a little bit more confident about that. Certainly at five meters, Absolutely, you see what's going on. You see the road, you see the houses. And when you get to 0.5 meters or, or 50 centimeter imagery, you can see the amount of detail that you can see. So that's the pixel size, the picture element, the spatial resolution, okay? And here's a comparison. There's 30 meter Landsat pixels and there's one meter um, pixels as well, okay? so. Um, a lot of detail on the one meter data. You can see some things on the 30 meter data. Again, depending on what you, whether you want a big view of a large area, the whole state of Montana or the whole um, Eastern United States versus a small area where you're trying to do detailed analysis. That would dictate the kind of spatial resolution that you might want. Okay. Spectral resolution, on the other hand, has to do with the wavelengths that get sensed in. So our eyes, again, only see in the visible portion of the spectrum, but remote sensing can sense outside the, the visible, and there's advantages of that. And so um, even the first Landsat satellite could sense in what we call the near-infrared portion of the spectrum. Landsat thematic mapper, when we got uh, to that in the 1980s, not only sensed in the visible, but also in the near infrared, in the middle infrared, and into the thermal or the heat portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. And so that's really, really powerful. Here's an example of what you might see. Here's Landsat uh, thematic mapper, and you can see the seven bands or seven wavelengths that got sensed in. And then we can put those bands together, we can put those wavelengths together to form what we call a composite image. And so you can see at the bottom corner there where bands three, two, and one, that's the red band, the green band, and the blue band. That looks like a natural color image to us. That looks like what our eyes would see. Um, but we can also combine other wavelengths together through a computer monitor and um, be able to see in additional wavelengths that our eyes have never seen in. And the power of that, especially for natural resources and for agriculture, for vegetation, has to do with the near-infrared band. So the near-infrared band, healthy vegetation gives off near-infrared light and unhealthy vegetation doesn't. And so we can actually detect vegetation stress or vegetation health using the near-infrared portion of the spectrum. And if you look at the next composite image that says bands four, three, and two. That's displaying the near infrared through the red portion of the computer monitor, the uh, red band through the green portion of the monitor and the green band through the blue portion of the monitor. Now that you, you can see there that it looks kind of strange, but not if you're familiar with this. And what that means is that the, the uh, Objects that are red or actually magenta there are healthy 
Okay, so that's healthy vegetation, that's agricultural fields. And so you can see all the nice bright red. But if you look in the, the big square in the center, we can see that there's parts of that field that are very, very healthy. There's a few red circles, and then there's other parts that aren't as healthy. And so that would be very useful to a farmer uh, or somebody who is uh, doing something with vegetation to know that uh, there's some issues going on in that field, that it's not as red as it should be. Okay, And so spectral resolution has to do with the wavelengths that we're able to see in, and there's some super advantages of being able to do that. So here's some Landsat imagery. This is of San Francisco Bay. So that's a natural color image, and there's a color infrared image where the vegetation, the healthy vegetation becomes this magenta color. Um, so if you know anything about San Francisco, you can see uh, at the bottom there is the city of San Francisco itself. There's a big red rectangle in there. That's Golden Gate Park. Just go straight up from there and you, you, you'll see a bridge. That's the Golden Gate Bridge that crosses over into Marin County. If you go right directly in the center, there's an island um, and there's a bridge connecting that island. That's the Oakland Bay Bridge that goes over to Oakland and Berkeley and that area. You can see um, really the whole bay. You can see part of the Pacific Ocean and you can see a few reservoirs in there. The vegetation again is magenta and the urban areas are, are bright, kind of whitish gray. Um, with the vegetation interspersed in there. This is 30 meter resolution, so not very high resolution, spatial resolution, but you can still see lots and lots of detail. And if you wanted to monitor forest change or agriculture, this would be a good data set, a good a source of imagery to use. Okay. Here's one meter data. This is one of my favorite images because um, this was the first commercial high spatial resolution satellite called Iconos. It's a panchromatic or a black and white image. But if you look closely there, you can see that there's scaffolding on the Washington Monument. And what they were doing was actually resurfacing, refacing the Washington Monument. And so they had scaffolding on there. But this image is taken 500 miles above the Earth's surface. And yet you can see that kind of detail with one meter um, pixels. And so high spatial resolution data has its advantages as well. Then here's some uh, other commercial satellite data. This is a GOI satellite. This is 41 centimeter pixels. So lots and lots of, of detail that's uh, really, really cool. And you can see buildings and trees and the football stadium there and um, all kinds of interesting things. And when you get to looking at the uh, Google Earth imagery, you'll see the same thing. And then most recently, we've gotten to looking at unmanned aerial systems imagery where we fly sensors very, very close to the ground. And this is three centimeter uh, pixel spatial resolution data. And so you can see individual tree crowns there. You can see the gaps uh, in the trees. And so this can be used for very high resolution natural resource management or for agricultural purposes or for, for lots of other things. So that's kind of an introduction to remote sensing. So now that you understand some of the basics, you're ready to look at some more imagery. So the activity that we have here will use Google Earth and allow you to see examples of the forests. And then you'll be able to look at another, at one forest over time. So um, please go and have some fun and have a great time looking at the imagery. And that, now that you understand what you're doing. So thanks for your attention.